So uh, welcome to our final and most awaited talk for the day on quantum information theory. We have with us Professor Mark Wild to present his talk on quantum entanglement, applications in communication and cryptography. A short introduction of Mark, uh, Professor Mark Wild. Uh, Professor Mark M. Wild is an associate professor at Louisiana State University, holding a joint appointment in the Department of Physics and Astronomy and the Center of Computation and Technology. He is a recipient of National Science Foundation Career Development Award a senior member of the IEEE and associate editor for the quantum information theory at IEEE Transactions on Information Theory. He's also a member of the editorial board uh, for the New Journal of Physics and Quantum Information Processing. He received his PhD degree in electrical engineering from the University of South Southern California, Los Angeles, California in 2008. He conducted postgraduate research as a postdoctoral fellow in the School of Computer Science McGill University in Montreal, Quebec, Canada from 2009 until 2013. He has published over 180 research articles in the area of quantum information theory, and he is the author of the text Quantum Information Theory, published by Cambridge University Press. And also he is the author of the forthcoming textbook, Principles of Quantum Communication Theory, a Modern Approach. His research interests are in quantum information theory, quantum error correction, quantum computation complexity theory, and quantum optics with, a, with applications to quantum communications. It's an honor to invite Professor Mark Weil for his talk. Professor, uh, the, the screen is yours. All right. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for having me. Um, it would be nice to meet you in person if the opportunity arises. So I'm gonna do the screen share now. Okay. All right, I guess you can see it. Oh yes, sir, we can see. All right, so um, can, can you remind me how much time I have? Uh, you have around one hour, 15 minutes. One hour, 15 minutes, okay. Um, please keep me on time. Yes, sir. Um, pl please let me know when there's 15 minutes left. Yes, sir. Okay, so today I'm gonna tell you about uh, various ways that quantum entanglement appears in quantum information theory with one of the main goals being to distinguish between the classical and quantum theories of information. So I'm gonna start with some things that might be pretty basic uh, for, for some in the audience, but maybe for others it will be new. I, I don't really know. And then we'll move on to more advanced concepts. Okay, but the goal is to show how entanglement arises in a variety of communication scenarios. All right, so first of all, what is entanglement? It's a strong correlation that two parties can share. Uh, indeed, as, as I said earlier, it's a key phenomenon that separates the classical and quantum theories. And it's something that cannot be created by local operations in classical communication. So the scenario we imagine is that Alice and Bob are, are located in distant laboratories and they, have, they each have fault-tolerant quantum computers um, and they're, they're allowed to exchange classical data. And so, you know, if they share some entangled state to begin with under this class of operations, the entanglement cannot increase. And so it's, uh, entanglement is a resource in this sense. And uh, this is the resource theory of entanglement. So this is a famous quote of Schrodinger. And uh, in case, you know, you might have seen it before, but he considered many years ago uh, this to be the characteristic trait that enforces uh, the, the departure of quantum mechanics from classical lines of thought. Okay, um, just some basics to begin with. What are the, the postulates we're gonna be dealing with? A state of a quantum system is described by a density operator, a positive semi-definite matrix with trace equal to one. Um, the positive semi-definite constraint is that all the eigenvalues are non-negative. And the evolution of a quantum system 
is what we call a quantum channel. And mathematically, that means that it's described by a completely positive and trace preserving map. Um, so, so the basic requirement is that a quantum channel evolves a quantum state to a quantum state. So it preserves the property of being positive semi-definite and it preserves the property of trace being equal to one. And the same is true if the channel acts on one share of a bipartite state. Okay, and that's the completely positive. Okay, and density operators can act on tensor product Hilbert spaces. Okay, what is the definition of an entanglement? We define entanglement in terms of what it is not. So if a state can be prepared by local operations in classical communication alone, it has this separable form and it's said to be a separable or unentangled state. So the way you interpret this is that in the background, there's someone who flips a coin or throws a die according to this probability distribution, a classical outcome X occurs, uh, that gets communicated to both Alice and Bob who then prepare uh, states locally, sigma X and tau X based on the, the classical letter. And the state that they prepare based on the classical letter is a product state. And um, if they then discard the classical outcome the state is a probabilistic mixture of these product states. So that's a separable state. And, um, <clears throat> you know, a state is entangled if we cannot write it in this form. Okay. And one thing I'll mention, it's not on the slides, I think, but um, it's an interesting question in computational complexity theory. If you're given a description of a density matrix, to try to decide if a state is separable or entangled. And that problem is known to be NP hard. So it's a, it's a hard problem computationally. And that's one of the reasons that entanglement theory is challenging. Um, because if we want to actually decide whether a state is separable or entangled already, that's a computationally difficult problem. Uh, the difficulty extends even if you change the, the way the, the quantum state is described. So if you instead say that the bipartite state is generated by a quantum circuit and you measure complexity in terms of um, the number of quantum computational gates needed to prepare the state, it's also known that it's, it's hard for, for this version of the problem, it's hard for a quantum computer to decide if a state is separable or entangled. Okay, so those are just some things I'm, I'm mentioning in passing, which I think are interesting. Um, and indeed, these separable states can be prepared by LOCC, and entanglement cannot be created or increased by LOCC. This notion generalizes to multiple parties straightforwardly. So if it's Alice, Bob, uh, 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 you know, Charlie and Dan, you know, just pick some random names. Then a, a separable state for a multi-partite, uh, for multiple parties would be extra tensor products here, right? Like we have a tensor omega XC, you know, tensor uh, rho XD, et cetera. Okay. So, but throughout the talk, we're going to focus on the bipartite case. Some basic notation I'm going to use throughout the talk. I mean, you probably know this, um, the Dirac notation. So classical zero, classical one are these vectors and the cats are the, the bras are the dual vectors. Okay. So what is the basic form of entanglement? It's the EBIT. It, we, there are different names that it goes by, one of which is the EBIT, another of which is Bell state, another of which is EPR pair, and um, it's this phi plus. So this is the density matrix for the entangled state. You have to excuse me, there's, there's yard work going on in front and I can't do anything about it, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, okay, so the basic form is this EBIT, this is the density operator, 
So you, you get the density operator by taking the ket and the bra and gluing them together using the outer product. And um, phi plus is this state vector. So it's this uniform superposition of zero, zero, and one, one. Okay, so that's a basic resource. If you're interested in what is the closest classical analog of entanglement, it's arguably a shared secret key. And that's due to a concept called monogamy of entanglement. What is monogamy of entanglement? Um, the principle states that if Alice and Bob are in this entangled state, then it is impossible for Alice to be entangled with a third party, like Eve. Usually we call it third party Eve in the context of cryptography for short for eavesdropper. So um, due to this monogamy, <clears throat> the correlations that um, uh, Alice and Bob share are, are theirs alone and not for any other third party. And so that's the sense of secrecy. And in fact, you know, <clears throat> if this is the case, if in some protocol, Alice and Bob can truly prepare this maximum entangled state, then they can perform local measurements on it to extract the secret key and be guaranteed that that secret key will be secret from anyone else in the universe. Okay. According to the principles of quantum mechanics. Um, so, you know, a secret key has those properties, right? So a secret key is something that is uniformly random. So if you do measurement outcome, if you do measurements on this maximum entangled state, the outcomes will be uniformly random if you measure in the Pauli Sigma Z basis. And um, the outcomes will be perfectly correlated. That's the zero, zero, one, one. The same as what, would, what we would like for a secret key. And... Uh, any third party, what they would measure is independent of the measurement outcomes of Alice and Bob. So a shared secret key has all these properties. And from a maximum entangled state, you can get a secret key, but the opposite is not possible. All right, what is entanglement useful for? I'm gonna talk about three things. These are basic things, you know, just to get us going. You've probably seen these before. Um, so I'm gonna spend a few minutes on each of them. Superdense coding. This is a this is a basic protocol. It was discovered in 1992 by Bennett and Wiesner, uh, published in Physical Review Letters. And the assumption of the protocol is that um, this this dashed line indicates like a physical line denoting the difference, uh, the dividing line between Alice and Bob's laboratories. Okay, and so we assume that beforehand one share of an EBIT is communicated to Alice's laboratory, maybe via a quantum channel, and another share is communicated to Bob's laboratory. So they start with this EBIT as a resource, okay? And then Alice performs, um, you know, she wants to send two classical bits to Bob, so she performs these conditional Pauli unitaries, sigma x, sigma z, abbreviated as X and Z for short. And what that will do is it will rotate this bell state to one of four orthogonal states, okay? And um, I don't have the, the notation for those states written on the slides, but I'll just say that they're called the bell states and they're orthogonal. They have the property that if you trace over one chair of them, you always get the maximum mixed state. Anyway, so Alice can, by performing these local rotations, uh, change the global state. And then if she shares, if she sends her share of the EBIT over a perfect qubit channel, then Bob can perform a bell measurement to decode the classical messages X1 and X2. So we can summarize this in terms of a, a resource inequality or a resource transformation. Excuse me. <laughs> the, the lawnmower is right in front. Okay, now we went away. Um, so the, the resource transformation is that by means of an EBIT and a qubit channel, you can transform these non-local resources into uh, two 
classical bit channels. So if we draw the, a box around the whole thing, then we have two we have two classical bit channels. Another thing I want to say is that the classical bits are kept secret. There's a sense in which there's a secrecy property, which um, I don't know. I don't know if people often think about that. So due to the fact that I stated earlier, suppose there's an eavesdropper right here tapping the line and trying to figure out which message Alice encoded. Um, then when with access only to this qubit and not this one, no matter what the classical message is, the local state of Alice's system here will be a maximum mixed state. And so it's impossible to figure out which classical bits were encoded into the quantum state. So you have the secrecy aspect as well. And um, you know, one of the things that's going on worldwide, and I think as well as in, in, in India, is the goal to build uh, quantum communication networks, right? And so one of the basic things that people are trying to do is to figure out how to distribute entanglement on a large scale. And so then if you had this entanglement, you would be able to do protocols like supernets coding and you would have this secrecy as well. So, um, you know, that's a major effort going on worldwide, worldwide right now. Okay. A year after supernets coding was discovered, uh, teleportation was discovered. And if you look at this diagram and compare it to the previous one, you see that kind of what we're doing is we're taking what Bob is doing and putting it in Alice's laboratory, and we're taking what Alice is doing and putting it in Bob's laboratory. And um, so that's teleportation. <clears throat> and the goal of teleportation is to communicate a qubit over a large distance. Uh, it, it could be a short distance also, but the goal is to communicate it using entanglement and classical communication. Okay, so the way it works is, um, you know, we assume that Alice and Bob share this EBIT beforehand, and Alice is trying to send a qubit, and then in her laboratory, Alice performs this Bell measurement, okay? And um, I guess in the previous slide, I didn't describe what that is, but we talked about how uh, using these local operations, Alice can... Uh, rotate the global state to one of four orthogonal states. And the, there you have four orthogonal states in a two qubit Hilbert space. And so those four states can realize a projective measurement. And that's what the Bell measurement is. Okay. So the teleportation protocol begins by Alice performing this Bell measurement. And then from that measurement, she gets two classical bits. She communicates those over classical bit channels, and Alice does, uh, Bob does these local rotations. And at the end, uh, Bob's qubit is reconstructed over here. This is probably the most fundamental protocol in all of quantum information. And, you know, this is the basic form of it, and there's all kinds of variants of it. There's, there's variants that are used for quantum error correction and fault tolerant quantum computation. There are variants used in quantum key distribution to guarantee security of communication. Um, uh, th there are, it appears all, there are multi-party variants. Um, I've worked with a student here at LSU on a topic called bi-directional teleportation. Um, and then, you know, you can start asking questions like, well, what if the entangled resource state is not a perfect bell state. What can you do? You know, and so there's been a fair amount of work on that topic. Um, and that's, that's one of the questions of quantum Shannon theory, right? So in these basic protocols, we can look at each of the resources, the bell state, the classical channels, um, or in superdense coding, we can look at the bell state or the noisy qubit channel, sorry, the noiseless qubit channel. And then we can ask the question, what if we replace the noiseless resource with an unideal noisy one, what then can we do? 
And then that's where you can start thinking like Claude Shannon did. You know, this is the Claude Shannon day, so we should think like Claude Shannon did. And, um, and try to figure out like rates of communication uh, subject to uh, communication with a certain error probability. Okay, so, you know, th these are basic protocols and then they lead to all kinds of other things. And so um, they're very interesting and fascinating. I wanna make a remark like I did in the previous slide that there's also a security aspect with teleportation. Um, if, if there's an eavesdropper tapping the line here and, you know, trying to use these classical bits to figure out something about the qubit being communicated, it's impossible. These classical bits, they are uniformly random and independent of the qubit state being communicated, okay? And um, so there's a security aspect. That's also important for the operation of the protocol because if, if the classical bits did have something to do with the qubit state tr being transmitted, then inevitably you would be learning something about the state via a measurement. And in quantum mechanics, there's this ubiquitous measurement disturbance principle. And so if these bits had something to do with the input state, you would be learning about it and disturbing it. And then you would not be able to reconstruct it over here. So that's, that's an important point. Um, another important point is that uh, there's, a, there's a famous principle in quantum information called the no cloning theorem. So the no cloning theorem says that an arbitrary qubit state psi cannot be copied. And then when you look at teleportation, you might wonder, oh, like the state's here and they get, it gets copied over here. And there's a sense in which that's true, but there's only one copy produced. It's like the state here is destroyed and uh, it's, it's no longer available here and it's reproduced over here. And so what's going on is that through the interaction of the bell measurement, the entanglement and the classical bits, you, you have this uh, property where the psi qubit state is reconstructed over here. Okay. So now I want to talk about the CHSH game. This is another basic uh, scenario involving entanglement. And uh, this, this is a variant of what Bell himself proposed in, I believe the year was 1964. So the game works like this. There's a referee and there's two players, Alice and Bob, and we assume that they're in distant laboratories. The referee picks bits X and Y uniformly at random, okay? Sends X to Alice, Y to Bob. And then Alice is allowed to do something locally and sends a bit A back to the referee. Bob is also allowed to do something locally, sends a bit B back to the referee. They win the game. The winning condition is that, um, that well, they, they win if the, uh, logical and of the X and Y bits is equal to the exclusive or of the A and B bits, okay? And there are different ways to play the game. One way to play the game is without any resource at all, right? Without any quantum entanglement, without any shared randomness or anything like that. And if they do that, their probability of winning is no larger than 75%, okay? And, you know, there, there's, there's a way, there's a simple way to prove that. I won't get into it. If you, if you look at my textbook that, um, you know, was mentioned at the beginning of the talk, I, there's a section that talks about this. And actually this figure is taken from that part of the textbook. Another way to play the game is with shared randomness. So what do I mean by that? Um, shared randomness is like, two coins that are correlated, like either they're both, both heads with probability one half or both tails with probability one half. So that's another way to play the game. That is a, that can be called a convex combination of classical strategies. And due to the structure of the game, it's possible to conclude that, um, you know, randomness does not help in winning the game. Still, the, the best that they can do is 75%. 
And I should mention that they can achieve this 75% if they always just report back zero. Why is that? You know, um, <clears throat> if, they're, if the bits X and Y are being chosen uniformly at random, uh, you'll get zero, zero with probability one fourth, zero, one with probability one fourth, et cetera. And um, three of the possibilities, uh, this, this left-hand side of the winning condition will be zero. And if they always report back zero, then uh, the exclusive order of, of zero is, is zero. And so they would win three-fourths of the time and lose one-fourth of the time. So that's, that's, how they, that's a strategy they can use to win three-fourths of the time. Okay. Another possible strategy would be to use a separable state. So that was what we talked about here. You know, they could, they could share a separable state and use, they could be allowed to share the state before the game begins. And what's, it's possible to show, and I believe this was first argued by Reinhard Werner in 1989, that um, if the state's separable, then they, they cannot win. Uh, they're still limited by the 75%, okay? But what's also known is that another strategy they can, they can employ is using the Bell state, okay? So using the Bell state, and then depending on which bit Alice gets, which value of the bit Alice gets, she'll either perform um, a sigma X or a sigma Z measurement, and then Bob, uh, you know, depending on the value of the bit that he gets, he'll either perform uh, sigma X plus sigma Z or sigma X minus sigma Z up to a normalization to make it a, an observable. Um, so using that strategy, uh, they can win 85% of the time. Okay. I believe the exact number is cosine squared pi over 8. And um, so that's a large separation between what is possible with quantum mechanics and what is possible with classical mechanics. And one can say that this was one of the first examples of a quantum information protocol in which a quantum advantage over a classical strategy was uh, predicted, you know. So this, this is very famous. Uh, CHSH game is the same as what's called a Bell inequality. Uh, this game has been experimentally tested many times now. And in 2015, there was, there was a real breakthrough experimentally. Uh, various experimental groups started reporting the ability to perform a loophole-free Bell test. What does that mean? Um, if you're doing an experiment and trying to implement this protocol experimentally, uh, there are two and even three major loopholes that need to be considered. Um, the first is what's called the locality loophole. Alice and Bob have to be far enough apart such that uh, by the time, um, you know, they receive these signals and report back, uh, it's impossible for Alice to send a signal uh, to Bob or Bob to send a signal back to Alice. So they have to be far enough apart um, such that they, they cannot uh, violate this, um, you know, um, they have to be in separate rooms or separate laboratories and far enough apart such that, you know, the speed of light comes into play as a, as a limit. So that has to be closed, um, and uh, the 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 detection loophole. There's a, that's another another loophole is called the det the detection loophole. So the typically this this kind of experiment is conducted in quantum optics, and so they're using photo detectors, and they have to be efficient enough such that um, uh, like. There's, there's a sufficiently large number of rounds where they're reporting back something um, and not all, you know, claiming too much that there's a uh, missed detection, you know, that the, there were no clicks with the photo detectors. Um, 
because otherwise they could be like uh, faking the, you know, there's an argument they could be faking the data that's coming back. Um, so those are the two major loopholes and a, a remarkable, uh, various remarkable experiments were conducted to close both of these loopholes. Um, one of which was in Delft, Netherlands, and another was in uh, Boulder, Colorado, I believe. Okay, and um, there was there was a third one as well. Okay. Um, by the way, if there are any questions for me, um, I don't have a problem if someone wants to interrupt. Uh, I don't know if I don't know what the structure is of the talk, but uh, it's also fine if people want to wait until the end. Oh, we usually have questions towards the end. You're gonna we're gonna do the questions at the end. Yes. Okay. All right. Good. All right. So I want to talk more about the connection between entanglement and secret key, and then we're eventually going to get to the the Shannon protocols for the Shannon day. Okay. So <clears throat> entanglement can generate a secret key, and we discussed this earlier. I'm going to mention it again. So. And, and this fact is the foundation of a whole research topic called entanglement-based quantum key distribution. So if Alice and Bob share this maximally entangled state or this EBIT you know, or the Bell state, whatever you want to call it, then in quantum mechanics, there's something called the purif purification principle. Uh, so it guarantees that the global state of their systems and any other third party, like the only possible extension of the state to a larger Hilbert space, such that when you discard a system in the larger Hilbert space, you end up back with the same state. The only possibility is a state of this form, where Eve, the state of the eavesdropper, a density operator sigma E is in tensor product with five plus, okay? So, you know, then they can perform local measurements on their systems. They can perform sigma Z measurements. And so what will happen is that if they perform this measurement, Alice will get zero, Bob will get zero with probability one half. The other possibility is that Alice will get one, Bob will get one with probability one half, okay? And those measurement outcomes will be independent of what Eve can observe. Okay, so the goal of uh, an, an entanglement-based quantum key distribution protocol is to produce a state of this form, okay? And suppose that you're not sure whether you, you're making a state of this form. How do you test for it? Turns out that you can use the CHSH game. So you would have many independent rounds of the protocol where you're, you're using a quantum channel that connects Alice to Bob, that could be like a fiber optic cable or a free space link. So you're using this channel and you're trying to make the bell state uh, with each use of the channel. So you can conduct your protocol and um, on, a, on a random fraction of the rounds of the protocol, you can test uh, whether they can, they can win the CHSH game. Right, and then if you're finding that they're winning approximately 85% of the time, then you can conclude that via this process, uh, they 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 can generate maximally entangled states. Okay, that's the basic idea of entanglement-based QKD quantum key distribution. Okay. Now let's get to the Shannon theory part of the talk, since we talked about the basics. So um, we talked about teleportation supernance coding as ideal protocols. We mentioned how there could be noise, like the, the entangled resource state could be noisy, or the channel itself, the qubit channel in supernance coding can become noisy. And then there's a, a wide variety of communication tasks we can consider in quantum Shannon theory. And so that's what these textbooks are about, you know, to, to analyze these in, in a lot of detail, right? And so today I'm just going to give you 
an overview of these different protocols so you can have a sense of the landscape and the kinds of problems that are that are open that people are thinking about. Okay. A basic example of a noisy quantum channel that's relevant for experimental practice is what's called the lossy thermal channel. And this is the model of it. Um, so we imagine that Alice has what's called a mode of light. Um, if you study quantum optics, you, you'll know what a mode is. And um, if you don't know what that is, just think of this as a qubit, okay? And, or you can think of it as like a, uh, a, a, a photon that's either in the vacuum or single photon state, or it could be superpositions or mixtures of those. Okay, so Alice uh, sends her mode into a beam splitter and the environment that's inaccessible injects a thermal state with mean photon number big N to the channel, okay? And so these two modes get mixed at a beam splitter and this is the output for Bob and uh, there's a fraction eta of the input that goes through. Um, and the other fraction goes to the environment and is lost, okay? Simple example of this is what's called a <coughs> um, pure loss channel. That's when there's just the vacuum state of the environment. But as you know, in quantum mechanics, the vacuum is, it's like supposed to model nothing, but nothing is always something. There's always this zero point energy. And um, so you, you need a fully quantum description of this to be accurate. So with the pure loss channel, eta is the fraction of the mean photon number that makes it from the input to the output, okay? So this is a basic communication model that you can have in mind while we're talking about, uh, while we're talking about things for the rest of the talk. Okay, what is a basic communication task? Simply to communicate classical messages, right? And this is, this is a diagram you can have in mind for this task. So Alice picks a message M from a message set, encodes that into uh, a quantum state of these channel input systems. And there can be a uh, little n of these, you know, little n channel uses, okay? So big N is noisy channel, that's what we'll use for the noisy channel, and then little n will be the number of channel uses. So while doing this encoding, Alice could encode the classical message into a very complicated multi-partite entangled state in principle. That would be one option. Another option would be to encode in a tensor product state that would not use entanglement. And so there, there are questions here, you know, what, given a noisy channel, what is the best method of doing an encoding? Does it suffice to use a product state or is it better to use an entangled state? So that's a, that's a basic question. And um, we only know so much about this question, actually. Uh, we, don't, we don't know as much as we probably should. So these systems go through the channel, and like we said in the previous slide, each of these channels could be like a thermal channel. And so something ends up in Bob's laboratory, these little n Bob systems, and then Bob can do what's called a collective measurement on all of these uh, qubits or modes that end up in his laboratory. So what is meant by a collective measurement an example would be Bob performs a general quantum computation, a general unitary, and then does measurements uh, on each of the qubits to try to figure out the message M that was transmitted. And M prime will be his estimate of the message that was transmitted, okay? So in the decoding, 
a collective measurement, we said it can be realized by a general quantum computation, and that would be a general unitary. If the unitary acts globally on all of these qubits, then if it's used in a different context, it, it might have the ability to generate entanglement from a, from a product state, okay? So sometime, sometimes people call this entangled measurement. Um, uh, I always use the term collective measurement because it acts collectively in all these modes or qubits. So we see that both in the encoding process and in the decoding process, uh, entanglement plays a role. It's there, you know, as where in the classical theory, um, <clears throat> it's not there. And so that's a distinguishing feature of the classical and quantum theory, that we have the ability to encode collectively, to, to generate entangled states, and to decode collectively. Okay, so in Shannon theory, um, for, for a fixed code, there are three parameters of interest. The number little n, the number of channel uses, the size of the message set. If we take a uh, log of the size of the message set, the binary log, that'll be the number of bits that we're communicating. If we divide by the number little n of channel uses, log big M over little n is the communication rate, bits per channel use. And the third parameter of interest is the error probability. So how well can we, you know, decode, what's the probability that we'll make an error uh, in this communication process, okay? So Shannon's idea was, well, it seems like everyone's interested in rate anyway, um, to have the largest rate possible. And we, we want there to be a very small chance of an error. So in the Shannon theory, uh, his idea was, let's focus on rate and let's coarse grain away these other two parameters. How to do that, let the number of channel uses little n become large and then demand that as the number of channel uses becomes large, the error tends to zero, okay? That was a very nice idea that uh, coincides with what is of interest in practice, okay? An assumption that we're making, just like Shannon did in his original work, is what's called the IID assumption, independent and identically distributed. So each use of the channel is independent of the next one and the noise is modeled identically, okay? And so it's a reasonable approximation for many communication scenarios, but of course you can question that. Okay, so how does entanglement play a role? We discussed this, you know, you can use a collective measurement. What's an example of collective measurement? We saw it in the supernense coding protocol. Bob performs a Bell measurement. That, that is implemented by um, a small quantum computation involving a controlled knot gate and a Hadamard, you know. So that's a collective measurement. The other way entanglement appears, we said it, the code words that Alice is transmitting can be entangled. And um, both of these, why do we want to allow these collective strategies? Well, we can achieve higher rates of communication. So if we limit ourselves to, um, you know, encoding information in product states, uh, that's, that's a limiting strategy, and that's, that's what's done in the classical theory. And if we don't allow for collective measurements, that's a limited strategy as well. And what we instead allow for is all possible encodings and decodings allowed by the laws of quantum mechanics. And then that's how we define capacity. That's the natural way. Given the physical setup, you know, we allow for all possible encodings and decodings then we want to know what is the fundamental limit of communication. Maybe it'll be hard to reach it, but at least we would know it as uh, physicists, engineers, mathematicians, computer scientists, whatever, you know, we would know the fundamental limit. So if your goal in life is to know, you know, what are the fundamental limits of communication? This is a way to figure out an answer to that question. And indeed, we know that 
there are channels uh, for which enhancements are possible. Um, there are many channels we're aware of for which uh, collective measurement gives a benefit to communication. Um, <clears throat> regarding the entangled code words, it's something that we only know kind of in principle. There's no, there's still no explicit example of a, of a channel for which we know that the entangled code words help. Um, all right, so I want to get into a bit more math since we gave a lot of discussion on the previous slide. How can we uh, mathematically characterize the classical capacity? So I don't know if I said it, but the, the classical capacity is the largest rate at which we can communicate error-free in the limit as the number of channel uses goes to infinity. Okay, and we can define a quantity that's called Halevo information. This is a generalization of Shannon's mutual information. So how do we define it? We define it like this. This quantity IXB is Halevo information. It's a, it's a quantum version of mutual information in which this system X is classical and this system B is quantum, okay? It's defined as this linear combination of von Neumann entropies. Sorry, I don't have the formula for von Neumann entropy, but um, you know, it's, it's a well-known thing for a density operator rho. The von Neumann entropy is minus trace rho log rho, where the, the log is the binary logarithm. Okay, for when, we, when we're thinking about Shannon theory, we use the binary logarithm. So this notation means, um, Take the state omega that has this form. This is a classical system where these are orthonormal states. This is a probability distribution. These are general density operators that can be input to the channel. And then you get a, a quantum state on the classical system X and the quantum system B. To calculate this entropy, you trace over the quantum system B. You get uh, you know, this density operator here. Just pretend that's not there. And then you evaluate the von Neumann entropy. In that case, it'll just be the same as the Shannon entropy of P of X. To evaluate this one, you trace over the X system, and then you end up with um, the channel acting on the average density operator. The sum could come inside the channel because the action of the channel is linear. And you would compute this entropy. And then this is the joint entropy of the whole state. OK. This is a measure of classical correlations that can be generated using the channel. Mutual information is a measure of classical correlations. Um, there's also a way to write it as uh, relative entropy of the joint state to the product of the marginals. And so it's like a comparison between the actual state and a, a tensor product state. And so that's a measure of correlation, you know, like how far away are you from a product state? So it's a measure of classical correlation. Um, we have this formula. For some channels, the classical capacity is equal to the Halevo information, OK? But in general, we need to do this limiting procedure to calculate the capacity. And this expression is called regularized Halevo information. So you plug in, um, you know, little n uses of the big n channel. OK, so that's this n tensor n. You evaluate the Halevo information of the tensor power channel, and you divide by the number of, by the number n. And what is this doing? Um, it's, it's allowing for the possibility of using entangled code words. That's what it boils down to. We can't really delve deep into that today. Um, but this, this regularized procedure, it's, it's allowing for the possibility of using entangled code words in conjunction with a collective measurement at the decoder. Okay. And then you could, having the limit as n goes to infinity allows for, you know, a general multi-partite could be very complicated and entangled state. Okay. That's the classical capacity. 
Unfortunately, um, this is only a formal mathematical expression. This does not give you a, an algorithm to compute the capacity. Um, and, and, you know, <clears throat> you, can, you can try to approximate it. So there's been a lot of work on uh, finding lower and upper bounds on the classical capacity. The Halevo information itself is a lower bound. Um, you can prove that, uh, you know, you can evaluate this expression for little n equals one, for little n equals two, for little n, little n equals three, et cetera. You can prove that the, the quantity is uh, monotonically uh, non-decreasing with little n, okay? Uh, the limit does exist. You can also prove that. Uh, it, it will converge to a finite quantity. Um, for for finite dimensional quantum channels. For infinite dimensional quantum channels, you need to place an energy constraint on the channel inputs. We're not really gonna get into that today. But the point that I wanna stress is that um, this, regular, this regularized expression is only a formal expression. It does not give you an algorithm. A, a large and, and uh, a, a big open and challenging question is to prove that um, it's uh, uncomputable to, to try to figure out the capacity. So this is in the theoretical computer science sense of Turing, you know. Um, if, if you, you know, is there an algorithm that, that will stop in, a, in just a finite amount of time to calculate this quantity? Even that is an open question, you know, that has not been answered. So that's an interesting question. Okay. Let me talk about this superadditivity. So there's a result of Matt Hastings following on work of Patrick Hayden and Andreas Winter. They proved that in principle, there exists a quantum channel such that uh, this inequality holds strictly, right? So we could divide both sides by two and then you would recognize that as an instance of this expression here, right? When n equals one, it would be the right-hand side. When little n equals two, it's the left-hand side, right? So they prove that there's, there exists a channel such that this inequality holds strictly. And the conclusion of that is that entangled code words at the encode word can boost the capacity. Why do I say in principle, um, the way the way the argument went is they they it, it was a probabilistic argument. They picked the channel at random and then argued that among all the channels generated randomly in this ensemble, there exists at least one for which the strict inequality holds. So what remains open is to find an explicit example of a channel. This is a major challenge. Um, uh, I believe there was progress from this on this problem from Pranab Sen, who was in India at uh, TIFR, Mumbai. Um, if you look him up in the archive, you'll see a fairly recent paper about this. Okay, so I'm going to tell you about some things that I've done to contribute to the topic of classical capacity. So far, we were just talking about codes. Uh, so we, we were talking about capacity. Right, and there's a question of like, well, how do we achieve the capacity? And um, there's a method that my colleague, uh, Saikat Guha and I, uh, Saikat is from Patna originally, but now he's a director for the Center for Quantum Networks at University of Arizona. So back in 2013, we designed what are called polar codes following on the classical theory of polar codes, uh, which the, the classical polar codes are now being used in the, the, the 4G standard. Um, so we you know, used a lot of I, those ideas to design polar codes for communicating classical information over quantum channels. And we proved that these codes can achieve the classical capacity. It was the first of its kind. There are questions about how to implement the decoder efficiently. So if you look in this paper, you'll see that that question is mentioned. Um, 
I would say that's a, a very important question for practice. Uh, Saikat has recently been working with uh, Kaushik Sesa Drishan, who's a former PhD student with me at LSU and the late John Dowling. And um, so they, they had a paper where they were um, trying to implement decoders for polar codes on an ion trap quantum computer. You know, back in 2013, I never would have thought we would be doing that now, like programming quantum computers, but the progress has been so rapid that there's all kinds of possibilities available now. And uh, so they programmed the, the ion trap quantum computer to try to uh, implement a decoder for, for correction of, you know, error correction. Okay. Um, another result I want to mention is for the, the, for the pure loss channel. That was what we mentioned earlier as a special case of the thermal channel. Um, in a paper with Saikat back in 2012 and Seth Lloyd and uh, Seth's former student, Si Hui Tan, um, we, we showed a particular quantum optical design of a decoder that uh, in principle could achieve the classical capacity of the pure loss channel. And a critical component of this um, method was what we call vacuum or not measurement. So this is a measurement that it's a two outcome measurement either it projects into the all vacuum state, the tensor product vacuum for n modes, or it projects into the orthogonal complement. What's very important um, related to the measurement disturbance principle is that um, the projection onto not vacuum, the orthogonal complement of vacuum, the resulting post measurement state should be the original state with the vacuum subtracted out. Okay, and so that's very hard to do experimentally. And I would say an important open question is to come up with designs for how to implement this vacuum or not measurements. There was a proposal back in, I believe 2012, 2013. Uh, if you look at the archive, the paper was called Measuring Nothing. You know, it's kind of a, a joke title, uh, but it was about measuring the vacuum. Right, so that's why I called it measuring nothing. And I believe the editors of Physical Review let Letters made them change the title. Okay, um, something I wanna mention is a tool that we used and it's seen a lot of different refinements. Um, the first instance of this tool was by Pranab Sen, whose name I mentioned previously. Um, and it's what's called a quantum union band. So it's this statement here. Uh, it's a quantum generalization of the classical union bounds. So the assumptions are that you have a state and a set of projectors, okay? Each projector could be um, one measurement outcome of a binary valued measurement, okay? So what you imagine is that you, and you know, each, each binary measurement is like a yes, no question. Right, so you could, you could imagine it being used in a context for decoding. You would have a measurement to ask, was the first code word sent? Was the second code word sent? Was the third code word sent? All the way up for L code words, if there's L messages. And this could be a sequence of um, yes or no outcomes, right? And so <clears throat> this expression right here, this is from the Born rule of quantum mechanics. This is the probability of getting a correct sequence of outcomes from a set of binary measurements, okay? And so it's analogous to the classical union bound as an intersection of events. You know, the probability that an intersection of events occurs, that all events occur, okay? So it's a quantum generalization of that. In fact, if the projectors commute, then the classical expression is a special case. All right, so this is, like a success probability, this, if you take one minus that, you get an error probability, okay? 
So what the quantum union bound allows for is for bounding this error probability from above by the error probabilities of the individual events, by, of the individual projections, the individual measurements, okay? And that's exactly what you get with the, the classical union bounds. We need a factor of four. In general, these projectors, they do not have to commute, okay? And so um, there was a recent paper, sorry, I didn't list it here. There was a recent paper in the archive called Quantum Union Bound Made Easy. And they proved that this four is essentially necessary. If you have many measurements, then this, they proved that uh, this is like close to being saturated. Okay. Uh, excuse me, so uh, you have 15 minutes left. Right? 15 minutes, good. All right. I've been talking at a kind of slow pace, but, you know, talking carefully about this classical capacity problem. So I'm going to pick up the pace a bit. But one thing that I want to show you is that um, there can be big performance gains for communication of classical information over a pure loss channel, right? So what we're looking at here is rate and bits per channel use versus photon number at the input of a pure loss channel. So you imagine that your transmitter is limited to send a certain number, uh, have a certain mean photon number. And the quantum regime is when that photon number is low, okay? And what this is comparing is the rate that you can achieve with a collective measurement that is also called joint detection. That's the Halevo information rate that we talked about previously. And these are traditional classical, these are the rates that you can achieve with the traditional classical detection method called uh, homodyne or heterodyne detection. You can see that there can be uh, big gains, you know, by using a quantum strategy. All right, um, I wanna mention I'm going to go ahead and skip this. Since the theme was entanglement, I want to talk about entanglement assisted communication. I'm going to talk about this scenario, and I'm going to talk about one other that's relevant to quantum key distribution, and then I'll wrap up, and I think I should get into time. Okay, so in entanglement assisted communication, this diagram is a generalization of the superdense coding protocol. Okay, that's what we talked about earlier. So we assume that Alice and Bob are allowed to share entanglement before communication begins. There's a message, M, that Alice would like to communicate to Bob. They can use the channel little n times. And then at the end, Bob can combine his channel outputs with his share of the entanglement to perform a decoding. And in general, it can be a collective measurement, okay? And the capacity is um, the largest rate of communication such that the error tends to zero as the number of channel uses gets large and then maximized over all possible encodings, decodings, and entangled states they could share. Um, how does an entanglement play a role? Well, we said, you know, it's a generalization of superdense coding. Already you see that there's this entangled state. Um, and even if the channel has a property that's called entanglement breaking, so that property is like with a single channel use, if Alice were to send in one share of an entangled state, then the resulting state is separable. It's actually known that even if the channel is an entanglement breaking, having this entanglement assistance can increase the capacity. Okay, so that's interesting and quite useful. Um, so <clears throat> what, what do we know about entanglement assisted capacity? Well, there's a very beautiful result. This, I would say, is the, the, the nicest generalization of Shannon's formula for the classical capacity of a classical channel. So this quantity is the mutual information of a quantum channel. Previously, we talked about Halevo information. It's very similar, except we replaced the classical X with a quantum R. So now it's a true quantum mutual information between a quantum system and a quantum system. The quantum mutual information is defined the same way, but it's with respect to a different bipartite state. So 
we imagine that Alice sends in one share of a pure bipartite state, sends in the system A to the channel, the channel acts on it, produces a system B in the state omega RB. Then if we evaluate the mutual information with respect to omega RB and maximize it over all inputs to the channel, that's the quantum mutual information of a quantum channel. The wonderful formula, the wonderful result, proved by uh, Bennett, Shor, Smolin, and Thapleyol Thap in 1999 is that uh, we have this formula for entanglement assisted capacity. So the entanglement assisted capacity is operationally defined. It's equal to the mutual information. Okay. Um, these are just showcasing some papers that I've written on this topic. Uh, one of them was with a student, Manish Gupta. It's about, um, you know, he, he's a former student of LSU. Now he's, he's doing a postdoc in India. Um, and we, we proved a strong converse for entanglement assisted capacity. This means that uh, this mutual information formula is a very sharp dividing line between what's possible and what's impossible. The strong converse says that if the rate of communication exceeds the mutual information, then the error probability actually converges to one. You know, so it's like there's a there's a sharp dividing line between uh, what's possible and impossible. And then these are some other things that I've worked on. Uh, one with Nalanjana Datta, who's originally from Calcutta, and um, <clears throat> these other collaborators. We were looking at something called second order asymptotics. I'm going to skip that. All right, let me skip a bit. I want to talk about um, I want to talk about this. Okay, so this right here is a model of quantum key distribution. Okay, this is like a information theoretic model of quantum key distribution. This is something that Saikat Guha and I and Masahiro Toka Masahiro Takioka in 2013, we worked on. So we we defined this model of communication as a model of quantum key distribution. So what is meant by it? Uh, in between every channel use, Alice and Bob are allowed to perform arbitrary local operations in classical communication. The classical communication can be leaked to an eavesdropper, so it's actually public classical communication. And there's a concept that I didn't talk about in so much depth, but every quantum channel has an environment, okay? We saw that in the model of the thermal channel, right? We saw that uh, all the photons that don't make it to Bob, they go to the environment, okay? So in this model, we assume that the eavesdropper has access to the classical data being exchanged between Alice and Bob, and the environment of every channel use. We assume that the laboratory of Alice and Bob are physically secure. Okay. So in between every channel use, they're allowed to do LOCC, and um, they're allowed to use the channel little n times. The goal of the protocol is to generate a secret key. So the secret key is... Uh, the secret key state. The secret key state is uniformly random, perfectly correlated, and independent of Eve. Okay. And then that's the ideal thing, but in practice, what they generate is an approximation of that. Okay. And what we call secret key agreement capacity is uh, the the you know the rate at which private bits, the, the largest rate at which private bits can be communicated such that this approximation error tends to zero as the number of channel uses becomes large. How does entanglement play a role? Um, what's known is that in order to generate secret key at a non-trivial rate, the final state of Alice and Bob must be entangled. Um, if it's separable, then, you know, we saw with the separable form, there's this classical data in the background, the P of X, uh, that we had in the, the original, the, the early slide. And if that X is known, then the state of Alice's and Bob's system is a product state. 
that it's impossible to generate a secret key from a product state. So the, in principle, if, if, if the protocol makes a separable state, the eavesdropper could have that classical hidden variable in the background, okay? So that's kind of the intuition for why it's necessary for the, the state at the end of the protocol of Alice and Bob to be entangled. Okay, and then another way that entanglement plays a role is that entanglement measures are useful as upper bounds and secret key rates. We talked about the interest in knowing the fundamental limits of communication. Well, since quantum key distribution is such an important protocol, we're interested in knowing what is the, the largest rate you know, at, at which we can do quantum key distribution securely. And so to, to tackle that problem, you can use entanglement measures. And so that's something I've worked on. This was with Saikot, and uh, this, was, this paper was with two others, uh, Marco and Mario. And we, in, this, in these works, we showed how squashed entanglement, which is an entanglement measure based on conditional mutual information, we showed how that gives an upper bound on quantum key distribution. And then in a later work, we showed how relative entropy of entanglement gives an upper bound on quantum key distribution. And we showed a strong converse rate. Okay, so <clears throat> this plot is showing you secret key rate versus distance. So for the pure loss channel, um, the transmissivity parameter that you can calculate as a function of distance. Um, you know, there's, for a fiber optic cable, it's characterized by something called an absorption coefficient. And we know that the transmissivity decays exponentially uh, with, the, with the distance. And so, you know, there's a, there's, there's a direct mapping between the transmissivity and the distance. And so in this plot, since experimentalists are, I think the general public would be interested in like uh, over what distances you can do QKD, this plot is interesting. So what it's showing is the rates that a number of protocols can achieve that are like some well-known protocols. And then this is showing the fundamental limit, okay? Squash entanglement gives you this upper bound, relative entropy of entanglement gives you this upper bound. I don't know if I'm gonna say much more than that. All right, um, I'm wrapping up now. Um, this is the book uh, that, that I wrote in uh, 2011 and put in the archive. And uh, there was a second edition published in 2017. This is a recent book that Sumit and I, uh, we're still writing it. It's a book in progress, but um, we put what we have on the archive and there's a lot of content there. Um, this book fo focuses on von Neumann entropy and concepts like typicality and typical subspaces. This book focuses on Renyi entropies, um, what's called one-shot entropies, and um, connections to hypothesis testing. And it, you know, this book kind of summarizes everything that was happening in quantum Shannon theory before around you know, 2010. And then this book focuses on everything that's been happening in the past decade. Okay, I also gave a lecture series on entanglement for the Xi Quantum Organization, which is an organization founded by a woman in India. It's meant to um, support you know, women pursuing uh, quantum information science. Okay. So wrapping up, entanglement, this was the theme of the talk. I was showing you how it, it is a you know, feature of quantum mechanics that is a strong separation between classical and quantum theories of information. We talked about many different ways for making use of entanglement. Um, we talked about superdense coding, teleportation, the, the CHSH game, we talked about classical capacity, entanglement assistant capacity. We talked about secret key agreement. What I didn't talk about is feedback assisted capacity, quantum capacity, those are other kinds of capacities. And it's really a big experimental challenge to generate and store this entanglement 
but um, we're seeing remarkable progress. You know, we, I talked about the loophole free bell test that was conducted. That kind of thing is necessary for large scale quantum networks. And then also uh, the ability to generate entanglement is important for quantum computation. With that, I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, for a wonderful talk. Uh, I'm sure everyone found it as useful as I did. Uh, we will take any questions right now. If anyone has, so you can leave them in the chat box or unmute yourself and answer. Oh, should I go to the chat box? Uh, it's fine. I'll uh, take a look at it. Okay. <clears throat> Good morning, Professor Mark uh, My name is Priya. Uh, yeah, my question is like uh, on one of your slides, it was mentioned that entanglement assisted communication is like a generalization of super dense coding. Yes. Yeah, so uh, like uh, a super dense coding involves uh, like uh, basically encoding. Uh, classical information in quantum states. So, uh, yeah. in yeah. entanglement assisted communication, isn't the information also quantum in nature? Isn't the what? Uh, information also quantum in nature. Oh, um, so, so the goal of superdense coding is to send these classical bits, right? And in entanglement assisted communication, <clears throat> We're still trying to send a flag. Okay. okay, so the inf message M is still a classical message, is it? Yes. However, okay. um, it, it, there is a version of entanglement of communication where you can try to send quantum information. I didn't, I didn't talk about that, but okay. it's, it's an interesting question. And due to the connection between teleportation and superdense coding, it's known that the entanglement assisted quantum capacity is half the mutual information. Okay. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for your question. Uh, next, uh, I, I have a question of my own, uh, rather a general question uh, okay. with regard to entanglement measures. Uh, so uh, I've uh, come across some entanglement measures which tries to quantify, say, for more than two systems. Yeah. Uh, does speaking about a measurement of entanglement between more than two systems make any sense? Or right as of now, they seem to be designed for particular purposes to quantify for particular purposes. So mm -hmm. uh, is it right to think about a notion of entanglement between more than two systems? Or how do you Definitely. Um, so th that's a that's a good question, and that is relevant for uh, multi-party secret key agreement. You know, there's generalizations of quantum key distribution where you're trying to create secret key between multiple parties. Um, there is a multipartite squash entanglement and there's a multipartite relative entropy of entanglement and both are useful. So um, I mentioned Kaushik Sesadrisan in Masahiro Takeoka. We wrote a paper um, about multipartite squash entanglement and using it as the bound for secret key agreement over broadcast channels. And uh, we've also written papers about multi-partite relative entropy and entanglement. Um, and that was also with Masahiro and Kaushik. So if you look up my name with uh, Kaushik and Masahiro, you'll, you'll find those papers. Um, I, could, I could send them via email if you'd be interested. Oh, thank you, Professor. That would be useful. Uh, okay. So, uh, so I'd like to thank uh, uh, Professor Mark Weil for this amazing talk. Uh, and 
on behalf of IEEE Comsoc Society of IIAC, I'd like to present this uh, play now to you as a token of our appreciation for taking out the time from your busy schedule to deliver such information to your informative talk. Thank you. Oh, very nice. Thank you.